Hello and welcome to the Vlogging Pod. Tonight we are joined by the author of the book called A Girl with a Knife, Alina Rubin. Hello. <laughs> welcome to the room. How are you this evening? I'm well, I'm excited. Wonderful. I'm excited to have you. So let's start right off. And I, I want to visit your past just a little bit, if we can. Um, okay. You immigrated from Ukraine, yes, in yes. 1991. And you grew up here in the States. And you went off to study IT, right? Correct. Okay. So tell us a little bit about being an IT analyst. How does that work out for you? Oh, it's, it's a pretty good job. So I went to college. Um in uh, 1999 at the time you know you know having a website was a big deal at the time and so i was studying web design and programming and that was pretty exciting and i, I knew that with that kind of degree i will get a good job and so that's what i did and it worked out well i spent 20 years uh, now in it all in the same company at the you know in, in exelon which is a big chicago area employer and it definitely is a Good job, you know, for somebody who is technical, you know, very, very little to do with creative writing, though. But uh, I do actually a lot, a lot of writing for my job, which is very technical writing. Right. Well, that, that still keeps you in the writing mode. Um, mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, like everybody else, you were on lockdown, right? Uh, yes, I, I was working from home, um, you know. Yes, and you know, completely changed. Like I no longer had to commute, but uh, I would watch a lot more TV, and <laughs> suddenly <laughs> had time for it. And um, uh, I guess historical fiction is what suddenly drew me, like to watch uh, different historical fiction series. <laughs> ah, so that's when you really started to get into the writing process when you were under the restrictions and you were home a lot. So tell me how exactly that came about when you decided to dive deeper into writing. So it was actually kind of strange because I've never really thought of myself of being a writer. The only creative writing that I did between eighth grade and pandemic was like, I would write these letters to my daughter about how she's doing, you know, what I'm learning from her, what I saw her learn, uh, kind of this kind of project I'm doing to give her when she's 16. That's really all I did. And I never really even imagined myself writing much. Until like one day, you know, as I was watching this uh, TV and historical fiction series, it just ideas were planning in my head and they were like keeping me up at night. Now, I was not even thinking of them as a book. I was just kind of watching them like a movie in my head. And then, uh, you know, one morning I just kind of woke up and like with this crazy excitement. And suddenly I was like, I'm supposed to be writing a book. I don't know, just something in the universe just kind of told me that this is happening and um, <laughs> and i just kind of uh, ran to my computer and just started writing and i didn't know anything about like writing a book or writing historical fiction a novel i just started writing and just things kind of kept happening well, that's awesome <laughs> you know, just kind of kept flying. I, I find that awesome because an idea really sticks and you find that you can't let it go until you actually put pen to paper i fully understand what you're talking mm -hmm. about so yeah. Tell me exactly why you chose 19th century England. Why would that time period for a girl with a knife? So the show that really got me enthralled was Hornblower. And it was about this England, the early, you know, early 19th century and they're on ships, which is, it's a end of the age of sail. There is fighting, there is, um, you know, ships having battles. And suddenly I envisioned my character, girl, you know, my Ella is a ship surgeon in one of these ships. And uh, there was especially one character I really liked in that show who, who is dying. And I imagined that she's going to save him. And that's kind of how I started writing about her. She was already in my story, a ship surgeon, and uh, she's saving all these people. I'm writing all these adventures about her. And when I wrote, I wrote the full manuscript, the novel, I showed it to my friends. They were like, surprised with this? Kind of interesting you know usually in these kind of sea adventures you never see a strong female character but then i showed it to you know i started finding out what I, who i need to show this to and i've showed it to an editor and to beta readers 
And the response was a little different. They were more critical, like, how did she even become a doctor? You know, what is her story? And they said something like, oh, a doctor gave her like a recommendation letter so she can go to medical school. And they were like, that would never work. <laughs> you know, not at the time, not at the time where women could not be even allowed into university. Right. And right. that's kind of when I got an idea. At first I was kind of, all my bubbles kind of burst. I was like, oh my God, no, nobody's going to read this book. You know, I cannot uh, work with this. But then, it was, but then I kind of turned it around. No, I was like, no, I just need to start over and go earlier in time. I need to figure out how she actually became a doctor. And I thought, well, either she had a mentor and somebody secretly taught her, or she disguised herself as a man. And I started re researching, like, has anybody ever done it? And I found a story of a, a woman doctor to, that's, who exactly did this for her, her whole career, and only at her death, uh, uh, as, you know, she was found out as to, to be a woman doctor. Her name was James Berry all her life. Nice. Except for, you know, early, early on, they knew somebody knew her name as, as a woman. So that kind of, so that made me realize, yes, women actually could do this. And I thought that would be a great premise for the story. And they just need to start over with this earlier story of her getting her education and finding her way into the university and getting her skills. And that's how I, I that really was the premise for my book that I ended, ended up publishing. Right. So now your earliest um, growing up was in Ukraine. Did you happen mm -hmm. to take anything that you learned from Ukraine and established into this book? Or is it simply on what you learned when you were looking for just over uh, the 19th century? Um, I mean, I, w I was very young when I left Ukraine. I was only 11. Okay. I think uh, what I maybe brought from my childhood, uh, my uh, I lost my mom at a very young age, just like my character. I was 14 when my mom passed away. So I think that kind of uh, that kind of trauma that helped me step into my character's shoes. Even so, even though it's England where I've never been and it's 19th century, which I I just wanted because I think I like historical fiction. It takes me away, helps me escape. But to kind of put uh, yourself in this situation and kind of knowing like okay, what it would be like, you know, to lose a mother at that age, which I knew and. You know, what, is, what was it like to have uh, friends who are not really your friends, who don't understand you? I knew all about that, too. I could relate to her like that. And it was just having, putting this conversation, you know, not talking like a modern teenager, but how, you know, two young young women would talk in 19th century as they doing, you know, whatever was interesting at the time, like embroidery or whatever, right. you know, they, they had, you know, they had to worry about. Well, this might, they let me know if this is too personal of a question, but when you said you write to your daughter, is it because of losing your mother at a young age? Did that start you to want to write to your daughter now while she's young and something you can give her as she gets older? It's possible. Like, one gift that I really treasure from my mother is my, like, picture album and her notes about how I was as a baby. Right. Because that was, I mean, not only it's pictures and anything... It was kind of a guide for me to figure out how fast, you know, when my daughter was a baby, like, is this normal that she's still, you know, eight months, it did, her teeth did not grow yet? Or is this normal that she's not walking yet? Because then I could see, oh, I didn't walk till I was a year old. You know, it kind of helped me compare and figure out those things uh, that I could not ask her anymore. But it, it's also just kind of a connection. It's something I heard that people do that write, writing to your child. And I just found it's a beautiful idea. And maybe I do have some fears, you know, what if something happens to me? But, you know, no matter what, I think it's, um, you know, something for her to give and, you know, something I could, you know, I made for her. Like, I don't draw, I don't, you know, make some kind of models or some kind of art, but I can write for her. <laughs> you know, that's my art for her. I actually think it's awesome. I really do. Um, something that maybe I wish I would have done myself. So let's dive a little bit deeper into A Girl with a Knife. Mm -hmm. Let's talk sure. about Ella Parker, your main character. Um, mm -hmm. Let's dive up. You give us a little bit about her losing a mother. Give us a little bit about her overall because um from what i looked into it she has a lot of mistrust for those around her tell us how that all came about so 
I wanted her to kind of show her journey. And in the beginning, she yes, she has a lot of mistrust. She kind of comes up with uh, different lies kind of to show that everything is going fine, everything is normal. Her father is sick, he is uh, drinking, she doesn't want to talk about, she doesn't want anybody to uh, know that he is some mentally, sometimes behave very oddly. So uh, she, you know, she kind of hides all that and makes it look like everything is being is going fine. Uh, so I'm going to make it almost her habit that she sometimes gives like these little lies even without thinking. Uh, but I think that what makes it believable that when she decides on uh, taking on her disguise as a young man, she's somebody who can do it. She's not above lying. She knows how to act. She used to do some theater, you know, with her mom, with her friends when she was younger. Uh, so this it, it works for her. She, you know, she's not so crystal clear that she cannot pull off such a disguise. And she's doing, you know, it's kind of living a life. And it's, she realizes it's kind of hard, you know. If, you know, anytime she speaks, uh, she needs to change her voice. When she walks, she needs to walk uh, like a young man. And it's not easy, especially as she's getting older and older and her body is changing. Yeah. So she's kind of living this lie and it's catching up to her. She's getting really nervous. And also she's very lonely. She spends as little time with other young men in the university as she can. She only, you know, she goes to class and then she comes back to her room to study as much as she can so she doesn't get involved in any parties or celebrations or anything else that may be going on uh, but i think that the lesson here you when you're true to yourself you're more powerful and she has to make some choices about what she wants to do with the rest of her life you know being a doctor is great but can she really keep up with all this uh, that she has planned for herself to disguise herself like that that's, I like that. I'm actually writing it down. <laughs> I love this statement. You say, when you're true to yourself, it's a very, you're very powerful. I like mm -hmm. that. That is a good statement. So with a girl with a knife, um, before you published, which I believe was um, February of this year, correct? That's correct. Okay. So before you published, um, I believe you were a finalist of the Illinois soon to be famous author manuscript. And right. so, so tell us, how did you find yourself entering that? And tell us about the process that went along with that. And what was your response when you found out you were a finalist? So one day I went to the library with my daughter and uh, a very helpful librarian, librarian was helping her with uh, getting books. Uh, and I thought maybe I'll just go and have it and ask her, what is it like to get my book into the library? I didn't have anything published yet. I, it was not even with an editor yet. It was pretty early in the, it, it was like, uh, but it was finished. It was uh, maybe second round of my own editing done. So. I uh, I asked her and she told me about this contest. She said, you know, you you will probably have to bring in your book. We we'll, we'll see if we're going to review it. But it's nice to to get you know yourself into contests like that because then other libraries will see you. So she gave me the website uh, information and uh, the day I went home, kind of re 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 reread my manuscript just one more time and I sent it in. It was pretty easy easy process. And then I just kind of waited, uh, but I started working with the editor, and uh, but I was kind of wondering, well, what's going to happen with this contest? Uh, and then one day I came to the website, and whoa, there's my name there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's nice. And so your book automatically, once it got published, was entered into the library, so you can find it in the library now? Uh, it is uh, in uh, my local library. So it uh, was not automatic. I had to remind them that, hey, I'm, I'm in this contest and I'm actually representing your library. But yes, they, they, took, <laughs> they took that uh, my book. And also soon afterwards, four, four or five more libraries in the area also <laughs> took my book. Nice. And I really enjoy kind of knowing that I have my book in the library. A couple times I ran in and took pictures with it. Nice. So I'm assuming that you are an indie author. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. All right. So how did you find the process of your first book being an indie author? Did you find it um, 
hard to master? Was it easier? Did you have mentors um, pushing you along in the right way? I used a lot of Facebook groups for writers asking questions and asking what should I be doing. And uh, eventually, that's how I found my editor. I found uh, the uh, advice for who, who to hire as a cover artist. And basically, that's where I found all the information, as well as some free books about how to publish. So there's a lot of free information out there about how about indie publishing. And also just talk to authors, some traditionally published, some people who left traditional publishing and went into in, indie authors and some who've been always indie authors. And I just kind of found in, being an indie author is easier. You don't have to wait for a pub, you know, to find an agent, to hope, uh, you know, to query, to hope that some publisher will take you. You just, when you feel your book is ready, you work with an editor, you have your cover, you can go go to a website and hit publish and you're in control now. And your book is now accessible to practically anybody in the world. That it is. I found it very empowering and exciting. Nice. Yes, it is to push that button. But then comes the trepidation and the fear. Oh my gosh, would they like my book? Yes. <laughs> so, yes. yes. But yes. For a long time it's like, uh, okay, 10 people bought it, but I think I know all these 10 people. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's been four months. I'm pretty, I mean, I'm pretty sure that whoever is buying my books now are people that I never met before. So nice. everybody who I know, they already got the book. I, so I know. I'm I'm... Some strangers, and I am getting reviews, and, um, and so, yes. so excited. People are writing it for me how they like it. I know. It's always ex it's always surprising to me because I don't really advertise my work anymore, but mm -hmm. it's always surprising to me when someone buys my book and I'll sell in Japan or another country and I'm always like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's very exciting. I understand that feeling most definitely. So since Girl with a Knife is the first in the series and that series, mm -hmm. let's see, I wrote it down here. Um, yeah, go ahead and give me the series name. I wrote it down, but I'm not finding it quick enough. Hearts and Sales. Hearts and Sales. Okay, thank you very much. I wrote it down, but I'm not finding it where I wrote it. <laughs> this is the problem of reading my own handwriting. Um, so since this is the first in the series, tell me what's coming next. Are you working on the next in the series? I am. I'm in my. I'm more than half through the first draft of the next book, which is going to be called No Job for a Woman. Okay. which is where follows Ella right where the first book ends. So she now wants to be a ship surgeon. And it's very difficult because the men at the time are very, especially sailors, very superstitious. They don't trust the woman. She's just troubled just by being there, leave alone uh, performing surgery. Wow. So it's a pretty hard environment for her to step in. And she no longer wants to hide that she's a woman. She kind of took, took the lesson she learned from book one and the, uh, now she, now she, maybe it would have been easier for her to pretend to be a man, but she just won't do that anymore. So with her being a woman and not being able to, in the 19th century of not being able to have a job like a man would, do you find any reference with any today standards? Do you find that there's still a hold back for women as far as careers? I do. In fact, I had some women in medicine talked to me and they said, you know, even now, you know, the, you know, yes, we can go to medical school or to nursing school, but there's still such a double standard that a male doctor is regarded usually more, more highly than a female doctor, especially in surgery. I recently looked at some statistics about women surgeon only as OBGYN, there is a kind of a 50-50 or maybe even a little more women surgeons. Practically in every other type of surgery, it, women surgeons are very small percentage. Oh, it is. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. You wouldn't think so in today's standards, but mm -hmm. as we know about our times, this seems to keep changing day to day. <laughs> mm -hmm. We either take a step forward or we take in a, a great leap forward, and I'm praying for more leap forwards. So as you're writing um, happened in the lockdown, what do you find different? Because I know you said during lockdown from, from COVID, you had more time to do the writing. Now I'm assuming you're back at work, yes? No, actually, it hasn't changed. That's kind of one 
nice thing about being an IT worker, we really can do our jobs from anywhere. Okay. And we kind of proved it that we can, <laughs> you know, it's it just, uh, well, you know, our management was not sure that we can do it, but we kind of proved it. No, we can do it from anywhere. So I continue working from home. Nice. <laughs> right nice. That, so you really took on that perk. So it's really helped you as far as the writing. Yes. Wonderful. So I was going to ask you if there was any time of difference, but you're still being able to do both. So that was freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so f from being, from what you've learned when you first started publishing and you're working on your second book, tell me what you would do different as being an indie from going from publishing your first to now. What would you do different with the second? I would say it's not that it's different it's just now i know more people i had the four beta readers for my first book now i can have uh, probably 10 and i would like to have uh, that at least that many definitely i'll use uh, everybody who i had for the first book if they're as long as they're available i have a couple of them became more than beta readers they were like critique partners they would like look at every sentence and highlight it and you know give me you know give me suggestions uh, uh but just to know that I've had people reach out to me and say, hey, if you're going to write the second book, I'd love to be a beta reader. So now, I have, you know, <laughs> well, that's now I have awesome. more people to go to, to, to help me. And, uh, well, that is awesome because obviously... Yeah, maybe I'll even have an ARC team, you know, so I can get reviews right away instead of waiting for like three weeks to get my first review. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, your re reviews were awesome. Everyone seemed mm -hmm. to really be into the work. So, because I, I, I'll be honest, I look at every little bit of information I can find about you when I do our interviews. Mm -hmm. So, I try to go a little deeper onto that. Um, well, tell me this. How do you think um, the progression of this book went different from the first? Now that you, you know everything, you're getting your feet more wet into writing and have all these background of people, how do you feel that this book is different, this next book will be different as far as its creational period time than your first? I think what's different is now that she's on a ship, I have to learn all about life on a ship. And I have like a stack of books about ship adventures, uh, fiction and nonfiction. And I know that some people are really into that world and know all about the types of ships and the types of cannons, you know, what could happen and what could not. And this is hard for me because, uh, you know, I've, I haven't done that much sailing, but and I but I need to get these terms right. So I think that's my, I think my biggest challenge. But as far as writing, I have taken writing classes as I was writing in Girl with a Knife, so I'm kind of keep using that knowledge. I think maybe another challenge is now it's like I'm balancing balancing writing and marketing for my first book. So I wear different hats and I'm not just writing and thinking about what my character is doing. I have to spend some time, uh, you know, marketing my first book and uh, reaching out and posting about it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very exciting, I guess, that, you know, doing such something like this, like the podcast, that's great. But it just, it's also how much time do I have for everything besides my job and my family yes. and all the research that I need to do. Right. So it's, just, it's just balancing a lot of things and just juggling a lot, a lot of things. I fully understand that. Being an indie, um, yes, it gives you the freedom to handle your book the way you feel that it should be as far as cover work and everything else. Uh, and in speaking of cover work, for my last question of the evening, because we're, we're ending our 20 minutes, but tell me how the cover came about. Tell me um, its creation, who you reached out to, how that actually went off. So in the, uh, one of the Facebook groups, I'm actually going to say which group, it's Moms Who Write, because it's such a great book. So, so great support uh, for each other. I think I asked the questions, or maybe I saw somebody else's question, like, how, who are good cover cover create com companies? And one that I saw come up was Get Covers, and I researched it. It was a company from Ukraine. I thought, of, you know, that I felt the connection there. I saw their covers. I liked them, so I reached out to them, and I gave them an idea of which of one of my critique partners gave me of, of a woman holding a scalpel. She showed me a, a similar cover where a woman was show, was holding a bird and she said, well, if you put it, you know, have something similar, but she's holding a scalpel, you know, in the appropriate dress for the time, you know, that could work. And I agreed with her. And what they sent back was like this, 
got a great cover of this uh, nurse with like blood on her apron and holding in. I mean, it was like for, for a horror story. I was like, wow. oh no, that's not gonna work. So we worked on the dress for quite a bit. Um, you know, got something that um, I thought looked nice, and I started showing it to book club clubs to readers. Did we lose? Uh, there you go. Yeah, they couldn't read the writing or something like that. And also they said, oh, it's kind of nice. It's kind of like the uh, Call the Midwives show. And I was like, oh, no, that's the wrong time period. <laughs> <laughs> so we really had to figure out what the speaks of 19th century. And they and people can read the writing well. And that's kind of how we came up with the cover. So probably it was seven times back and forth till we got it right. <laughs> Well, for, for all our listeners, since they're not able to see the cover um, right here, uh, it has a very 19th century wardrobe look to your uh, lady in charge there. And it's mm -hmm. Heart and Sales, book one, A Girl with a Knife. And this is again by Alina Rubin. Please go check it out. Alina, you have been delightful. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for being on my program tonight. And I want to thank our listeners once again. I truly enjoy that you guys come in. It is awesome. So thank you so much. Until next time, everyone. Bye-bye for now.